guys. We're going to get started in one minute. Um, the first few people we have reading um, will be um, Ian Park will start us off, and then we have Dig Wayne and Bill Constantine, and then Jack Zappos. <coughs> and um, what that will be. And then uh, Bert Baroff will be reading, and then um, Madeline Artenberg. So that's just the lineup. And then as we go, I'll keep naming people. Uh, are right. you, am I on the list? Yes, you should be on the list. Yes, you are here. Yes. We're I going, um, I just want, okay, so uh, well, let's get started. Um, I'm going to mute everybody. Okay. And um, this is everything here, but guys, welcome to Fahrenheit Open Mic. My name is Linda Kleinbub, and I'm very happy to be here. And I'm really happy to see everybody on this. It's a beautiful day outside. And the fact that you chose to come to your computer and be with us, I'm, I'm really honored. You know, it's really, really special to me. And, and I hope you have fun tonight. So um, thanks for being here. Um, I wanted to thank my lovely timekeeper, Ms. Madeline Ottenberg. Um, she has her timer there if you want to make it have a ring so they know what to hear. Um, everybody gets three minutes and at two minutes and 30 seconds, you will hear the ding. Um, please don't stop where you are, just finish, but know that you have to wrap it up. Uh, your three minutes includes your intro, your name, where you, you know, so if you start saying I'm from Chicago and my father's name is Joe, that goes into your time because we have a lot of people and we want to get everybody up to the mic. So, um, you know, you could say your name if you like, but then really just get to your piece. We're recording, uh, we're streaming it live on Facebook Live. And then it'll be a YouTube video as well when it's all said and done. Um, so um, this is my last Zoom show for the Fahrenheit series for now. Um, I'm hoping in the summertime to go into somewhere outdoors. Um, we started looking at venues like um, community gardens in the Lower East Side, but right now I don't have anything. I'm also starting to look at spaces to bring the Fahrenheit show back to a live uh, bar type environment because um, Black and White Bar has closed because of the pandemic. So um, I'm open to you know, suggestions. If anybody knows a good outdoor space, that would be good. We were looking to do a show in June, July, and August, and um, then go back indoors maybe September or October. So we'll see how that goes. Um, and um, one of the reasons I chose not to do a Zoom in the summertime um, was basically, you know, if you had, well, the July show is on July 4th. So I don't know who wants to be on Zoom when it's on July 4th, but, um, I just thought it was too nice. So if you have the urge on the first Sunday of the month in June, July, or August, just go outside in front of your house and read your poetry to your neighbors and you can keep the spirit going that way. And um, so everybody knows about the three minute rule. You wanna let them hear the ring? Can you do that? You gotta unmute yourself. And then I'd also like to thank my head of security, Mr. Philip Giambri. Um, thank you for all his help. And uh, that's the timer. All right, so I decided that um, I'm gonna read two short poems tonight and they are, one poem is one of the very first poems I ever got published and the other poem is one of the newer poems that just got published. So um, I'm gonna begin with um, a poem. Oops. Hold on a second. This is called, It Lives in the Basement and it was published by the Algebra of Owls back in 216. It lives in the basement. Loneliness crept up the stairs, stood in a corner, observed the situation, searched for the easiest to infiltrate, curled around her unknown, smoke unseen, Loneliness holds her tight. She thinks its warmth is comforting. Quickly, she's left abandoned, alone, trying to make snow angels at midnight. And this was recently published in Home Planet News. And this is called Dance, Green, Breathe. I am the Lorax. I speak for the trees, Dr. Seuss. I'm still learning. I seek wisdom from trees. I climb to the top of the shady corner of the little league bleaches. I am leaf level. Hideaway in the park, breeze reminds me of other things. FaceTime plans begin to emerge. Good to see you in person again, even on a tiny screen. We're still in quarantine. Loneliness grows in dried grass on empty play fields. Making plans to travel during quarantine requires a good cancellation policy, should the virus spike. 
research what attractions are still closed. There's always the waterfront, open air distractions of a park, trying to break the humdrum dailies. I climb to the top of the Little League bleaches to be oak leaf level, silent in their story whispering secrets of longevity. Stay planted, rooted in your space. Don't try to stop the wind. Let your body sway. Dance, dream, breathe. Thank you, everybody. And now the show is yours. And we will continue with um, Ian Park will be our first reader. So um, unmute yourself, Ian. Hello, um, everyone. Yeah. I hope you're doing all well. Uh, it's very windy here and sunny. Hot, warm, but very windy. OK, so I'm going to read uh, a one poem. And it's a pretty new. Uh, I did some editing. I live in San Jose in California. I grew up in Brooklyn. So this is my hiking adventure. This new hiking place I went. Oh, not new, but you will see. At the peak of Mission Peaks, it took us three hours and 36 minutes and 40 seconds, reaching and making to the top of a mountain, a crazy long and intensive hiking trail I ever had. After getting my first COVID-19 vaccine, it was a honey's, honey's idea to go. The weather was nice and we both needed exercising. As much as I wanted to be here, since every time we kept on delaying it, I saw Groundhog for the first time in a parking lot. I was looking at the people who were cheating, uh, uh, sitting on the benches. I saw a big hole and saw something keep on sticking his head up. I got up a little closer and noticed that it was a mouse looking thing with a big fat chicks. It was a squirrel for sure. I went even more closer to take a picture, but it refused to come out. And I saw many other holes around it. It was kind of cute. I didn't want to go all the way up because I haven't been exercising. I thought I wouldn't be able to do it, but Bahani insists that we must make it to the top. It was rocky road and there was a lot of cows. Cows were just happy eating their grasses, peeing and pooping. I didn't see the, unu I didn't see the usual brown cows. Most of them were black. I don't know what happened to the rest. I even saw the youngest calves that were so small. I don't know why, but the calves were always get, getting rid of their waist, showing their butts, and we can see all the unpleasant view. The elevation on this hiking trail was insane. It was very hard to go up. It reminded me of when I was bicycling up the hills in San Francisco Bridge. The roads got narrower. When, when we were almost at, ta at time, which was very dangerous, because once you fall down, you are dead because the height was high enough to see the sunset and the view of a whole center set in one side and another side was few of hills and trees. I saw turkeys running around wild while I was walking and I wasn't fast enough to see them up close. However, I saw herds of cows. I even saw little birds by the rocks when I was taking off the rocks out of my sneakers. These little birdies came so close to me, I was shocked and it was afraid of humans. Then two of the other ones shows up and enjoy a company until my honey used the hiking sticks to try to hit it. I screamed and said, that is me. Uh, when I noticed them following me behind, they decided to stop because this little girl got uh, their attention and they were afraid they might get harmed by the hiking sticks. We didn't see the rattlesnakes, but saw a hawk. We were both sore when we got home. Thank you. Thank you, Hien. And next up we have Dig Wayne. Uh, and reminder, your time starts the minute you open your mouth, even if your poem is not started. And when you hear Thank the beep, you. you still have 30 seconds after that to wrap it up. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. All right. Dig Wayne, everybody. Thank you. Hello. Hello. This poem, this poem is called Blue Roses. <sighs> she always brings me beefy t-shirts, you know, the heavier fabrics. Her way of nesting, bringing me cozy redoubt, buttered on both sides, keeping my belly round, my allure ropey, scurrying home from the foundry, airborne brick dust in her eyebrows, her jaws jammed with synthetic, synthetic stuffing from our neighbor's patio furniture. I told her the man there had a high-powered daisy, he was spoiling to sting a trespass. 
She held out her hand and I took it. Her steel-toed pajamas left little to the imagination. She clawed my doughy back, savoring my DNA. Burrowing came to her like a tight shadow. Our wallpaper matched perfectly. Worldly in her ignorance of the timid male who needs no reason, she was ready to drop cloth to raise some pity patter. My legs had always had a fear of heights, unlike jumping beans. My hesitation was a meditation. After closing every window and door in the house, the wind cracked through our love like an amber tidal wave of granularity. We knew who we were and who we didn't want to be. People can go to hell in fiery shopping carts. Trees are full of secrets. Ours is not a love song in three verses or a poem that rhymes with blue roses. Her left turns drain the blood out of my face. Mothering the nursery of raccoons on the roof only makes me fearing of a need for wings on her blades. The rings around her eyes run with moist solidarity. Trees are full of secrets. She holds out her hand. I always help her down. They cannot touch her. Thank you. Thank you, Dig. Good to see you again. All right, next up we have Bill Considine. Uh, thank you. I'll read um, three sonnets, recent ones. First is Our Song. Ah, memories of the day's outrages cut sharply as we fade into sleep. What we leave behind still matters. We can't escape a world so strange. We sing like a rebel army marching through a village to sirens and applause. I grind my teeth. You stir and toss. We murder our fathers with loud guitars. We awaken to what's been lost and clamor in darkness for a past before the fascists came, reclaimed. Please strum, please strum your banjo, I'll string a fiddle. The tune evolves, a tender call, together to start a day again in the right key. Together daily. Together daily, we've sipped and drunk love's refreshing ecstasies like caffeinated green tea. We nestle, paired, ceramic doves, once all aflutter till storms abated. Wrapped in comforts, how big we become. Cruel time, while leaving, still holds us here, embracing our time together. We're from the future, savoring now what stays dear. Your Venus, the night's most certain star. We each take our turn at the wheel on the highway in a fast moving car, floor the drive and speed our spirits to heal. Our high beams pierce the darkening road. We're headed where even mountains erode. And the final one, Sunday, March 14, 2021. Confined a year in deadly pandemic, Emerging from a cold snowbound winter into brilliant sunlight, a steady wind, I've reserved a socially distanced walk in the Brooklyn Botanic Garden. February's lasting snowstorm slowed the spring. No cherry tree blooms early this year. Magnolia buds seem mere pussy willows. Daffodil Hill has only sheaves of leaves, tipped with yellow daubs if you look closely. But oh, crocus blooms in abundance, blanketing the berm abutting Flatbush Avenue. Orange-tongued, purple, ground-cover crocus is no solitary venture out into life. It's nestled, teeming crowds. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. All right, next up we have um, Jack Zappos, and then we have Bert Baroff, then Madeline Ottenberg, then um, we will have Margaret Yard, and um, Ron Brenham. Ron Bremer will be up. So, um, Next is Jack Zappos. Go ahead, Jack. Okay, this is called the short poem, Perhaps I Am a Ripple. There are ripples on the water, flowing on the bay, seen on the surface, but known by a deeper source. Seen as separate yet part of the vast waters, 
playing with the light, playing with the depths. I know depths. I long to be a ripple, vibrating as far as can be seen, with prayers of light to the one. Perhaps I am a ripple. Haiku. I bought a hat today. It feels good on my head. The salesman was kind. I bought a hat today. It feels good on my head. The salesman was kind. This is called Naked. Naked. I am afraid to bear myself. Why? There are traumas of old, though I, long, though I long to be free. Naked with a belly scarred from surgery. Naked with hair, naked with blemish. I will not be ashamed. And vulnerable, naked and vulnerable. With the shyness that goes with it. Naked in thoughts, naked in body. There are walls and thoughts that bind me. It's time to undress. It's called, come here to the river. Come here to the river, the river that you know. The river from high mountains, rushing down to the meadows, splashing rocks with a misty spray. You know the river, you hear the flowing. It is your path, it is your life. Do not fear the jagged rocks. Do not fear the foamy rapids as you are streamed to places not known. Please drink this water with long, deep drinks. You know the taste. You know it's cool and clear. This is the river that holds you with compassion as you surrender to the flow towards riverbanks unseen. Thank you very much. Jack, all right. Next up, we said we had Bert Barrow. Are you ready, Bert? There you go. Okay. Yep, all set. Stroke by stroke, a painting birthed by a biased brush, hyperbole, alienation, and disdain leaves no space for the nuanced line, for strokes of understanding, acceptance, love. The hour has arrived to lift a gentle brush, paint a palette of softer colors, embracing all manner of hues, framed in empathy and oneness, a canvas unblemished by the warts of willfulness. There is no paintable other. There is only a portrait of we. Wearable. At moments when life is amiss and God appears to be an ill fit, the presence of nature beckons, offers a wardrobe of wonders and her inexhaustible fountain of wisdom and love. Cast your eyes on a menu of miracles, birds soaring on the wondrous, on their wondrous feathered wings, our gorilla cousins, displaying canniness and strength, elephants in herds of family togetherness, ants building mounds at the mound of mansions, the wise old owl hooting his smarts. And then there is the enigma of humankind, cruelty, caring, happiness, sadness, Belief, disbelief, empathetic, distant, seeing much, bathed in blindness. It is nature who paves and lights the path to flower beds of love, way filled fields of peace, orchards, orchards of ripened, faith filled fruit. Observe, touch, taste and hear the nocturne of nature's sympathy. Thank you. Thank you, Bert. Next up, we have Madeline Ottenberg.
So nice to hear everyone, to see everyone. This is Soft Hand. Mother calls for me in skipping tones. Her legs do not support rising. She sits shrinking on a bedroom chair, can't bear the touch of help. I encircle her thin spotted hand. The softness startles. I do not remember softness. Her flying nails had raked skin raw. She wielded wire hangers. I hid under tables. She caught me by the hair, pulling it along half a house length. Now, her eggshell hand tugs at my skirt. She cannot poke her bird head through the sweater neck. Rivulets of wrinkles run down her breasts. The nipples bite her belly. My hard heart shatters. Dear Madeline, and next up we have, um, did I say, I believe I said Margaret Yard was next. Hi. Hello, welcome. Thank you, my first time. It's nice to see everyone. Welcome. One poem, um, shall I start? And yes, can you ahead. see me? Can you see yes, me? Yes, we can see and hear you, go ahead. Okay, fine. COVID. COVID forces a schism between living and existing. Its insidious rampage floods our days, wherein existing demands isolation and estrangement. We hang lifeblood strangulated within solitary confinement. In these strict and empty spaces, forced to abandon the phenomenology of our shared moments, left hostage, plasticized in bloodless digital domains. Our hearts forget to cry, starved of tactile warmth, blood felt nurturance, the immediacy of desire, pulses of ecstasy, of vitality, of spirit, of life song, redoubtable code worlds will never find me, know me, feel me. Marooned, I desiccate, dried mammal, unknown, unrecognizable, trashed life product. No, I say, I cry, I want, I feel, I crawl, I scream, seeking the other, lest we all lose our hearts and our fallible mortality. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret, welcome. Hope to see you, well, I don't Nice know to see you. you. Anyway, um, Going on next, we have Ron Bremer, then we will have um, uh, Dan Nitza, Carrie Radner, Mark Johnson, and Judy Turk. So um, those are the people coming up. So Ron Bremer, you're up next. Okay, hello everybody. I have a couple of weird ones. Kiss the bear with a golden arm, squeeze its tummy till it cries, deliver it from every harm while it licks and chews your eyes. Give that bear a metronome to help it buy a mortgaged farm where you will construct a giant dome and live in peace with nature's charms. And my second one, innocence and despair date each other frequently. They kiss like their lives depend upon it. You think this should not be happening, but it is. You think this should not be beautiful, but it is. Random samples of Caucasian guilt and children's laughter are bleeding from cuts in your carcass. Only yesterday, the time was ripe for the disposal of solitude, trouble, and the meaning of life. You don't know if now is the right time for whistleblowing, so you dispose of the whistle before it causes trouble for your solitude and the meaning of life. Meanwhile, innocence and despair are on a date and kissing like their lives depend upon it. Thank you. Ron, all right. Um, next up was Dan Nitzer. Go ahead, Dan. Thanks, everyone. This first one, these, these are connected by uh, the water. This first one is this failure in the sky. 
The sun set 20 minutes ago, but word hasn't spread to the East Bay. A boy stares up at the drifting black clouds, losing color every moment. A gust of wind spreads his lips. The beautiful girl beside him is lost in her insecurity, but you wouldn't know it from her proud, straight posture. Here it comes, he thinks and says. The damp air is coming to absolve him of his fears and regrets. The beautiful boy beside him is shifting on his feet, feeling their need for reprieve, feeling responsible for this failure in the sky. Pale custard yellow becomes pinkish blue. Birds are calling out again. God has changed his mind. This next one is called 1994. There is a picture of me and my mom on a Northern California beach. You can tell from the hair it was the 90s, the waves lapping up sunlight from the crest of their tongues. There's a dog in the background and silver beams of what could be a drawbridge just under the tree treetops. Mom is smiling and pushing my right knee higher up her back, thinking about the photographer, soon to become her husband. I'm smiling and looking at something off screen, thinking about the year 2018 and who I'll become once I've learned my ABCs. This last one is a lot, I wrote this a lot more recently, it's called The Silence. I've seen the water this tranquil before, in between passing ferries and party boats, sun-kissed ripples skipped like pebbles across the river, and the industrialized world took a hit of this indica. Maybe Labor Day or July 4th, the city and its Western stepbrother were in sync with nature. There were fewer car horns than usual, fewer destitutes screaming over their douchebag dubstep Venga Boys remix, even fewer planes and helicopters, but there was never this silence. Even the lap dogs are quiet. At this frequency, they can probably hear God's voice, but I am still waiting. That's it for me. Thank you guys. Thank you for being here. All right, next up we have um, Mark Johnson. Okay, um, these are some old poems I wrote over almost 50 years ago. First one's called Traps of Time. Caught as we are and neatly bound round in nervous little knots of time and circumstance, who can think long enough, far enough to try to untie the bonds which moor us world side? Daily doings which undo and make us mockeries of men, marked as we are and sentenced to a common end, which every person, great or small, does their level best to stall. Should we look forward, better back, keep straight on or leave the track? Hearken unto signs divine, try to have a high old time or put it off, try to delay and make the best of work and play. The latter course it seems is best if one but put it to the test. And then this next one I wrote way back. I've been finding old poems of mine around the house. This is called, Do You Remember All the Guys Who Gave Us Death? <laughs> back, back in those days when things were fair to middling and nothing left little to be desired, when, when the drinking gourd was readily seen, if not so readily followed, when for the price of a song, you could find out where you were at and even stay there for a while. Provided, of course, the fig leaf fit right and enough people would agree to look the other way when trying made a difference and love was still a four-letter word, meaning not being afraid to show another person how good or how bad you felt and they not afraid to show you. Back when giving felt good and you could still tell when and how much to take. Yeah back in those days. That's all I have today. Mark, next up we have Carrie Magnus Radner. Hi, everybody. Great to Harry. see everybody today. Uh, two short poems. Steady. Steady as it comes, this big love is becoming too much. Like a bull, it rushes in 
fastest lightning slamming me against the wall. I have nothing against you. I hope that you're in also in this, in the thick too. It's been so long, but does it sound like me being the steady one? Why should I always be the steady, the straight man when I'm with you? Do you know the things I could possibly do? Please don't twist my words around. Just because sometimes I need to be alone doesn't mean I don't love you anymore. If you're currently following the score, the bull doesn't always win, but then I am not always the matador. I'll play along with this familiar song both of us can do. Why should I always be the steady, the straight man when I'm with you? Do you know the things I could possibly do? Second poem. Thank you. Twilight at the Upstate Shack. Wonder what is on the living room television at this hour of the day when the blue hour takes hold of the house, transforming it into a magical spot ready for nighttime. Mom is still driving on Route 71, five minutes away. She's bringing home roasted chicken for dinner. Her family is bored, sunburned from a day at the pond. Daddy is airing out his sandy shoes out on the porch. He pours some wine and sets out some Italian salami he knows that his wife likes with some aged Parmesan. And the kids are still bored in front of the TV as night grows deeper. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Carrie. Guys. All right, next up, we're going to have Judy Turek, J.R. Turek, and then we'll have Bob Heeman, uh, then Big Mike, and Evie Ivy. So, um, and Lou Grupa is in that group too. Okay, go ahead, Judy. Okay, terrific. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to miss this. I missed Poetry Month already. All right, I have two poems. Composition. I write haiku on gun wrappers. I write poetry on the inside of cereal boxes. I write my stories between the lines of trashy novels. I write cliches on my slipper soles. I write greeting cards on the Chinese food menu. I write political editorials between dictionary lines upside down. I write your name in coffee steam. I write slick poetry prompts in the Target ad. I write my eulogy over every day and pray it's premature. I write one act plays in the voting booth. I write love letters to corporate conglomerates. I write comic monologues while sitting in the dentist chair. I write I love you in beach sand. I write algebraic formulas in acrostic formation. I write my name in purple permanent marker on your heart. And a new poem. Zoom on a Saturday afternoon. Poetry in person is better than poetry on screen, but this is what we have in a pandemic and I'm grateful for it. The poet reader has little inflection in his voice, but his metaphors are inspiring. Fierce rain is pelting the window beside me. I chide myself for being distracted and turn back to my PC screen. I scan the gallery of mini portraits and see you upper left. I watch as your head nods down, snaps up like a pneumatic jack, then fades and falls. Your chin rests on your chest. The rise and fall of your labored breath announced, your mic left on. Distracted again from the poet reading, I want to reach through the screen and shake you awake, but you snore on. The host, video, and mic off, apparently distracted or off on a bathroom break, cannot mute you. I see heads in the gallery twitch left and right, then turn in your direction. Surprise, disbelief, smiles registering. The poet drones on, unperturbed by your snoring. Nothing to do but lull to the metronome of breaths, loud and sputtering like wind chimes in a storm. I find myself hypnotized, head heavy, eyelids spluttering like butterfly wings. I stir, listen, but all is silent. I blink in the dark, look at a blank screen, and the clock blares the truth. I've been asleep for hours. Thank you. Very much. Next up, we have Bob Heeman. 
Okay, hi folks. Uh, three information pieces. Information. The poem never ambitious enough to be included in their discussions, to be included in their anthologies, to be included in the dreams of co-eds. Their poem was what was left after they walked into the sea, what was left after they described the night, what was left after their fantasy was no longer a fantasy. It was a poem more suitable for writing on a wall or for setting adrift in a bottle on an angry sea. Information. It wasn't his fault that all the actors looked like actors, but it limited the way in which the story could be told. Even the dog only looked like it was playing a part. The words she said had been scripted but somehow meant something different each time she said them. The road that they followed led them off the stage and into the forest, which they had never left. It was there that the story became real. Information. No matter how much she tugged on his ears, they didn't get any longer. The history for Sithi has never included what happened next. It was not true that she changed into salt. Thank you. Very much. Um, next up, we have Big Mike. Routine. Just me and my bro, General George Washington, chilling out in Union Square Park on a late afternoon in the spring. The warm weather and the bright, sunshiny days have finally returned to the city. She scouts all the park benches with her very, very expensive Japanese digital camera and a long zoom lens strung from her neck as she marches up and down the park paths, looking for an appropriate subject for her next photograph. She's a deeply tanned, California-faced hippie girl in denims, cotton shirt, and sandals. Her long brown hair tied back in a casual pun. Uh, a 21st century Georgia O'Keeffe. She passes by my spot in the park bench while I make a concerted effort at eye contact and smile, wave in her direction. She returns my smile then quickly moves on, continuing her search to the park for that perfect subject for her telephoto lens. I'll wait, she'll be back. 10 minutes or so later, she's headed back toward my park bench. Eyes meet mine, smiling. Camera lens pointed straight at me. Do you mind if I take your picture? Sure. I knew what she would ask. Art photographers are always asking to take my picture in Union Square Park. It was just a matter of time before she asked me. I seem to be a perfect photographic subject these days, so I unfurl my fork, Vikings white beard for her inquiring lens. She takes a few shots standing above me, stoops over for a few more, squats down right in front of me for a few close-ups, then gets really, really close up in my face for a few super close ups. Clo so close to my face that I can see my own reflection in her camera lens. And I look good. I mean, real good. Perfect for that real New York street person photographic subject. Thanks. She gives me one more sweet little California hippie girl smile and moves on. Like I said, I'm pretty much used to it by now. You know, dude. Whenever you show up, somebody always whips out a camera and starts filming. You know what they say? Why don't you take a picture? It'll last longer. And just as a final note, the Pyramid Club, a longtime iconic dance club in the East Village, closed because of the COVID-19 uh, restrictions. It had been there for 40 years. But the staff reopened the dance club at a place called Drome down the street. And it was considered press worthy. So the media showed up. The New York Times photographers and the New York Times videographers all were photographing me and videotaping me all night long. They were all around me. So the, the routine continued. Thank you. All right. I'm sure the New York Times had, had fun taking care of seeing you dance, Mike. Um, all right. Next up, we have Evie Ivy. Then we're going to have Lou Grupa. And then we have, um, and I'm sorry if I mispronounce the name, Joni Zohisiki. Um, and you can pronounce the name the right way when you get up. But next up, we have Evie Ivy. Let me unmute. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to read two quick poems from my book, The Platinum Moon, 
And the first one is called words. Words form my expectations. They make my bed. They create my scenery, materialize my honesty. They will conjure love, but won't always move into the right direction. They rain down or blossom in perfumed sways. Words explode with comfort and dismay in the mind to target the soul. Steel capped, frail ones, often not on stone. What is there without words? Because even silence can say, because words are sound. I fear the no I give you is written on the sand and it is about to rain. And the second one is called Emporium. <laughs> Emporium. In some other planet, yes, you can exchange, undo parts of your life. You can go to an emporium and pick up or exchange if love does not work out for you or even a house. If it made you more miserable than happy, you can go and exchange, get your years back, even if, if you are, lost not the receipt. Then oh, you oh, can the choose <laughs> to go through something like a car wash and come out new again, clean of those years you gave it. No memory, thus no scars, free to try again or live on. In some other planet, you can undo. Thank you. Thank you, folks. Um, I just want to say somebody on here, they, they're listed as iPhone and I don't have your name. Um, is that Janet Wade? Um, iPhone 5 was, yes? Janet, right? Okay, okay. I thought so. I wanted to make sure. All right. Um, now let me go back to where we were at EV. Then we had uh, Lou Grupa was next. Right? Let's go, Louis. Thank you, everybody. Um, this first poem I wrote January 20th, right after Biden's inauguration. 2021, Joe and Jill and Jabari and Julia, the powers that be, we joyfully joust. Andy and Albany, tax the rich. Don't be afraid to call them a son of a. The squad is, young, is growing. It will soon be a platoon. AOC and Jamal are shooting for the moon. The working class is rising. How fast and far will we grow? Our struggles will lead us to the future we go. Uh, this next poem uh, uh, recently uh, passed away, one of the great big poets, Lawrence Ferlinghetti, and I always like to read this once a year at uh, Gordon Gilbert's uh, readings of big poets. This is my favorite of his, The Rebels. It has a double entendre of the shooting star and us, in his case, 50s, in my case, 60s radicals. The Rebels, star-stricken still, we lie under them in dome of night as they wheel about in their revolutions, forming and reforming. Oh, not for us, their splendiferous phosphor fabrications. Ah, the wheelwright of it, whoever he or she or it, chief fabricator of the night of it, of the night to set it in this cut glass diamond diagram. Upstairs in the lighted attic, under the burning eaves of time, lamps hung out to guide more far out voyages than ourselves. Stalantic stars shoot out, burst out. Errant rebels, even there in the perfect pattern of some utopia, shooting up, tearing the silver web of perfect symmetry. As in a palm of hand, the perfect plan of time, of, of line, excuse me, of line, of life and heart and head, struck across a sudden by one cataclysmic tear. Yet all not asunder, all not lost to darkness, all held together still, at some still center, even now in the almost incendiary dawn, as still another rebel burning bright strikes its match upon our night. Oh, okay. 
Next up, we have uh, Joni. Uh, please tell us how to pronounce your name. I think it's, is it Zosiki? Um, Joni, are you here? Where are you? Zosika. All right. Uh, yeah. Welcome. Hi, thank you. Um, okay. I just figured, oh no, did I lose it? Oh, this is crazy. Just give me one second. Okay. I figure I will interject a song. What the hell, huh? It's called Bavanera. And uh, it's by lyr lyrics by anonymous music behind schedule. I'm feeling sentimental. It's that photo on my mantle that rocks me soft and gentle. I'll never get a handle on those memories that haunt me. They reach out and taunt me. They take me away from the world. I'm feeling green and bluesy, just like an old time floozy. It's slightly less than lousy without the dope or boozy. I look into your eyes, but your photo never recognizes me. So many bumps and grinds on the lumpy road of life. You always gotta carry a red Swiss army knife. Just cut the cord and thank the Lord Goddess Universe that it wasn't any worse. I'm feeling catatonic, which is better than moronic. If I drink a gin and tonic, the world becomes symphonic. The back keeps, backbeat keeps on playing as the world keeps grinding away. That old man river keeps flowing into the bay. Well, that lucky old sun just rolls around heaven all day. Just for fun. Thank you. That was lovely. Thank you so much. All right, that was great. Okay, um, coming up, we have uh, Linda Lerner, and then we will have Peter Straga and Har Harvey Sauce and Judith Lee Herber. So Linda Lerner, you are next. Linda, are you there? Okay, Linda said she might be late because she had something going on. So we'll come back to Linda Lerner. So, um, Peter Schrager, you're next, and we'll go back to Linda. Peter Schrager will go up. Unmute. Yeah. <clears throat> One moment. Uh, uh, yeah. <clears throat> White, see the white complexion bedazzling me, reaching me from the white sun millions of years later. White, see the white complexion as a flawless vessel of happiness, waiting a moment in time for the revelation of a perfect countenance, smooth as a kiss, pure as a thought, life as air, making gods in heaven pray to mortals, begging them to be kind with their immortal souls and be raving them with a countenance, born in the sea waves, as if it were the magic white foam, vibrating, glowing, raising to their ever immortal bodies, inspiring, sensual, beguiling, conveying them the pure taste of beauty. And the second one, how I meander between people and I am no river to flow over the stubborn stones that break the will of the waters, that break their endeavor to be sharp stones bleeding waters. I meander like a slender teen, looking for green, looking for green, teen, green, green, teen, T, 
tea, green teen tea. I meander like a slender being to avoid the terrible, horrifying being next to me. Too close, you're too close to me. Stay away, stay away, don't cross my way. Just be and go your way. You're choking me with your presence. I loathe you. Looking for green, looking for green tea, green, green tea, tea, green tea, tea. I meander through the town. And when I see you, I fade away. I shun you altogether. What I adore now is to keep my social distance. I'm always measuring my social distance. Six feet away and happiness will come. Six feet away and I will survive. Six feet away and I will find love only six feet away. Thank you. Hey there. All right, next is Harvey Sass. And I, actually, I saw Linda Lerner there. I think we'll go back to Linda Lerner first. Linda, are you ready? Yes. Okay, we'll go to Linda Lerner next. And then Harvey Sass. Yeah, and apologies. Um, I had some household problems and someone who was supposed to fix something came late. And worries. I needed worries. to get some food. And, okay. Um, this is a poem. Um, since the um, Kentucky Derby was yesterday, and I was thinking about starting again, renewal, um, I'm going to read this poem, The Starting Gate. It's from my book, Yes, the Ducks Were Real. Um, and I have another one, possibly. The Starting Gate. It's that moment just before the horses break out. Not the race itself or the bets placed, but that moment I thought of one Brooklyn morning on an F train as it pulled into my station. Everyone turned toward the doors as if anticipating a subway messiah. The train stops, but the doors don't open, not right away. Every morning, the waiting time lengthens, and just like at the track, when the horses burst out, a gasp let loose envelops us. So that morning, on the verge of packing up my life once again, it wasn't a new place, new city, another job I was fixating on, but the starting gate, those train doors, waiting for them to open. And I have one more short poem. This is a recent one. I'm getting back to normal. I jump at the chance, but bearing the scars of what feels like having been in a war-torn place, the number of dead tallied each day, each week, each month, no place safe, and the body count exceeding those in three wars. Is it even possible to open up as doors to restaurants, movies, businesses open, to let in others without fear, even forget where I've been for a moment when someone with a nice smile asks, would you like? It's late and someone I haven't seen in a year moves too fast to hug me. Will I duck for cover? Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Next up we have Harvey Sass. Hi, uh, my first poem is rather confessional. It's called Manana Man. Up next in the diorama of human evolution is the fellow who had his tonsils plucked out at 60, having discovered, get the kid a tonsillectomy on his late parents Dead Sea Scroll to-do list while going through their things. Odd man out reputed to have been delivered by an absent-minded stork. Always last one off the school bus, slowest, biped to catch up to the Mr. Softy truck. It is fair to say that better late than never was destined to become both his epigraph and his epitaph, his diary full of, I'll get to it tomorrow. If he had been a woman of a certain age, she would have been late for her menses, putting in danger any second date. He earned his tag from a Latinx girlfriend who discovered that during girlfriend sex, he didn't always pull out in time. Where others dragged their feet, his were shod in cement boots, flogging the same tired apology for his latenesses. 
his apologia didn't pass the sniff test promising next day or the day after he'd wash it along with his three days worn socks and underwear. One can infer from the bony crest of his brow his close relationship to our late friend Hamlet, whom we've discussed before, a couple of bow wows. Like Hamlet, he was consistently unheroic, an anti-Superman. No one who knew him, having spotted him on the horizon, would ever exclaim, it's a bird, it's a plane, it's manana man. Sorry to say he was determinedly less than every man when it came to promptness. If timeliness were next to godliness, he would have given his contemporaries the devil of a time, as he doubtless did his parents and teachers. Looking for a mighty mouse to save the day, not to worry, manana man is on his way, on his way, on his way. Second one's called The Disappeared of Argentina. Comes that dirty war knock on your door to tell you that when the alarmed clock is clapped its last castanet, there will be one less place to be set for breakfast. One more pile of tostadas and media lunas going untouched. Neighbors will confirm this has all happened before, if not to them, then to someone you know. One of Los Desaparecidos, your usual fourth for bridge in need of replacement. Some other's hun, son who, like yours, hadn't passed the loyalty test. Later, you will be informed that your house first came under suspicion because its garage was left leaning and not right. Its shutters didn't hang with that military precision the junta demands of us. Loose Spanish roof tiles advocating for a limitless view like pink flamingos poised for flight. Survivors croissant cold now crowd around the breakfast nook. The air trembles where a man should be, was, isn't. In the back seat of a black Maria Alberto, Juan or Jose splutters through his bloodied lips, knowing he's never going home again. Cry for me, Argentina. Cry for me. Harvey. All right. Next up, we will have Judith Lee Herbert. Then we'll have Howard Flanza. And then I'm Rita Valen and Patrick Hammer. So uh, Judith Lee, you are up next. Okay. I'm going to share my time with Alan. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I'm just reading one poem. It's an absidarian, which means it goes from A to Z, 26 lines. In black and white. Auburn hair, glossy, sleek, in a ponytail. She blows smoke into swirls above. Holds a cigarette she's bummed on the bus to the demonstration in Albany from the handsome ex-soldier just returned from war. As if in a film noir, they have met one another's eyes, greeted each other in glamorous black and white. He with the thin line across his chin, she intrigued by his strong, rugged demeanor. Not jaded, but slightly scarred, he's seated as she stands. He kids with her when she asks for his seat, laughs and offers her to sit on his lap. They are married four months later, their futures not traditional, no white picket fences. He climbs over fences, leaflets factories, organizes unions, marches on picket lines. They ask of the world many questions. In dungarees and plaid flannel shirt, she remains committed to just causes, sings folk songs of grief and hope, strums her guitar. Together, they devote themselves to those who are underdogs, unseen, unserved, undone, visit the dark side of human nature, risk all. They want people of color to have the same rights as whites. Friends are exed from jobs, homes, families, cities, life. Yet my parents survived, slightly scarred as they fought zealously to repair the world. Okay, and now uh, my husband, Alan. 
Give him his own three minutes, Madeline. I don't the sharing the uh, time. So. I have a yeah. very brief poem about a current trend. I used yeah. to be an only child till I had them search my DNA. Then I discovered I had 125 siblings. Yes, I'll never forget that fateful day. I received that response from relatives of us with CC to my all my new sibs. Hello, we've got a pleasant surprise for you. Seems you all sprung into being from the very same test too. Your real daddy was a sperm donor and he gave till it hurt. And all of you are the result of that large fateful squirt. So now my life is richer in many a regard, except when I've got to send out another damn birthday card. Thank you, Alan. All right, next up we have um, Howard Flanza. Okay, three short poems. Robo judge. I have judged myself. I am guilty. Programmed by an algorithm. I cannot appeal my conviction. The law does not allow it. All judgments are final. I have revealed government secrets without knowing I had them. I have no legal recourse. The law is absolute. My mind will be wiped clean. Nothing will remain to me except the shell of my body. I will be reprogrammed. I will not be my again. Just another artificial being leading a new existence. I will pray for my spirit before I am expired. Next, future flight. When you're pinned down like a beautiful butterfly, you cannot move. You are locked in place, frozen to stillness, like so many others who cannot rise in the air. Take flight or blend with the leaves, waiting for the wind to blow and carry you far away. And then, <clears throat> fog bound. Naked structures slowly unveiled, topless towers of Ilium rising again to haunt us. The fog floats away, revealing the river. The mist dissipates. All is visible. All is nothing we expect it to be. Thank you. All right. Okay, next up we have Amrita. Hi, Linda. Hi there. Okay, this is the first time, so please excuse me. I, uh, I'll, I'm just starting with the one poem I've selected. The last poem. The last poem fills my head today. The unwritten one, yet unthought. The one I will write before I die. The one which will be left to fling away my dreams before the miscounter unpublished, let it lie. The rough craft of my cloistered life. I have it in my heart, seeds of words that are weaving a last garland, tiny thought buds dormant. I don't yet know if we've even met. But I feel a foreign wreath inside. Some part of me died and was mummified. And the sarcophagus split apart, searching for light as the soul did depart. Some precious pearls, parting gift for you. And no, I cannot unwrap it. My soul decides when it has to go. The muse plays my strings hard and taught till I let go. And then all of it, all the love, all the light, all the precious tenderness inside, like a river that reaches its sea, overflows, offering a last sunset, bestowing a last dewy flower, holding out gold hourglass, drips the dreamy sand of the last sunset hour, caressing the pressed petals of every ancient memory, beloved anchors that kept life afloat in rough seas, the dry, dark, brown, withered rose that glowed velvet red and passionate shall be dull no more. 
The card that hides shall play peekaboo with you from the dusty corners of cabinets too. A wedding card, a baptismal gift, a child's leasing sock, a licorice leasing mist gets written down for all its worth, forever compressed limos in words. The flat iron forged linguistic semaphores of fleeting, ferocious, fathomless life. Crown of wreaths and spikes, I leave it on the table. Wear it on feast days, I have partaken the same fare, worn the same crowning diadem. Pardon my departure, and if you grow a fresh bud anew, on this dead branch of the tree of life, I thank you while I can for you. You are my resurrection, my friend. That's all. Thank you. You did a great job for being here for the first time. So congratulations. All right, we have no 11, then Patrick Hammer, then Janet Wade. So no 11, you're up next. Greetings, all. So, sorry, I was just getting myself ready. This is called Techno Insta Society, or the Disjointed Union. What is it you wanted to say? A thousand voices joined into disunion. Nothing for today, no meat on the table, no voice on the radio. Reviews and self-satisfaction scream in millions of digital voices. Blog your thoughts. Be the generation of me. Be the generation that fell into nostalgic dream. Pillows of yesterday suffocate voice. Disjointed approval lays the land bare. Entertainment available to everyone, but the food on my table costs more than I can pay. Blood for blood. Will slides away into happiness. Let me view yesterday on my computer again and I'll inject the internet into my veins. Doped up cyber dreams glazes the will to do anything. Say our independence all together now. Agree on nothing or settle for self-serving slaps on the back. Grassroots points to aimless wanderings. Don Quixote says, sign up, sign up. Forum rules into clamor pit of millions where none rise to the top. World collapse and we can read about it on the AP wire and minute news. Watch instantaneous knee jerk reaction. Long term goals no longer exist. Voice no longer exists. A scream amongst a million doesn't exist. Placation is supreme. Digitalize your nostalgia. Who are we? And this last piece, this is untitled. I swear, I had like some happy pieces like queued up and it just, it just didn't happen. I swear to God, I'm gonna read some next time. Uh, this is untitled. The circular system has left me in a tizzy but that just leaves me the fool for not expecting the coming and goings of the repetition that pounds its deadly beat in a tribal dance that says, march in line, kid. There is no escape. So be prepared to take the weary eye flight in because the uniform you'll wear is gray. But I'll tell you the secret. I've had my ear to the ground for the sounds of the train march that has swept up the many and discarded the few. And the repetitious beat of the line dance is a word pounded in our head. And the word says, give up. And the word says, no light. And the word says conformity. And the word says I hate you. And the word says why bother. And the word says resentment. And the word says anger. And the word says you lost. And the word says don't try. And the word says it's over. But that beat isn't my line to dance. And I say to you as I say to it, I'm free. And I say, I will live. And I say, the color may be lost, but I sure as hell can tell you what it should look like. And if you come to me and think you can get me to join the Dance of Grey, I'll say you won't. Thank you all. Hello. All right, next up we have uh, Patrick Hammer, then Janet Wade. All righty, two poems from the Outer Boroughs celebrating the uh, reopening of all of New York City. Hothouse Orchids. In the hothouse, in the botanical gardens, in the Bronx. They come with cameras, cell phones, video equipment to capture the confetti colors, the almost edible candy beauty of tropical ice, honey slippers, exotic summer clouds, and memories, love's memory fizz of nun's cap, the dong delights of Featherhill fanfares and saffron surprises, of stargazers, the lamplighters, of Ruby's lips 
and the other side of cool. In the house that's hot, in the Bronx, in the gardens botanical, they stand under fans, gigantic ferns, watch the moth orchids flutter, the cane orchids flutter, the epiphytic pose. The other poem is in the Chinese scholar's garden on Staten Island on the North Shore in Snug Harbor in New York's Chinese scholar's garden. The Japanese haiku I start refuses to be contained and so it grows here on the moon viewing pavilion, terrace of crispness, here inside the pale, paid our dollars to be this side of the gate, separate from other park visitors who watch us through metal slats like spears. Oh, we here on the inside think ourselves more one with soil, water, stone, bamboo, more grateful to the gods for a rain-free, sun-full autumn day. No one notices inside the lithe movements above the pond's other reflections of a small yellow black-flecked butterfly easily fluttering out of this fortress into open land, free to follow the breeze wherever it goes. Thank you. Patrick, next up we have Janet Wade. I am woman. I am woman, hear me roar. I am smart, ambitious. I am proud and strong and ready to soar. Above all the negativities and uncertainties from, accept, from existing in a man's world, I am she, the statue of liberty, challenged to the core. I am woman. I stand alone, unapologetically. I have been scorned, rejected, discarded by a lot. Yet I am committed to life and living it free. I am God's reason for bowing on the cross to set me free. I am not the answer for what you think you see. I am the gel, the glue with the integrity to be. Creative, beautiful, challenge and free. I am woman, fierce, authentic, and living for I am me. I have the roar that starts from deep within, that encompasses the negativity keeping me from the king. I'll pull this roar into the surface be and see how many sisters will roar with me. And the other poem I'm gonna read is an is I to Echoes. Bewildered, confused, baffled by his own love song, the pen wing tears fell. Bewildered, confused, baffled by his own love song, the pen wing tears fell. Regrets live within the crevices, mind and heart, his name is engraved. Regrets live within the crevices, Mind and heart, his name is engraved. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up, we will have Don Fuchs, then we will have Patricia Carrigan, then Michael Anton, and then Deborah Clapp, and then the withdrawn. So Don, Don Fuchs is up next. Hi, good evening. Uh, first one is called Bye Bite. Bit by bit, slowly I turn, step by step, bite me, ones and zeros. Zeros and ones, one and done, zero in Bitcoin, can't bite down on it, bite me. One gigabyte, one terabyte, one teraflop, one floppy disk, one floppy dick, bite down hard, bite me, bite me, bite my neck, chew me out, chew me up and spit out. Not enough to chew on, bit of honey, mosquito bite, I don't drink wine, comedy bit, once bitten, hope the lunker, not enough to chew on, bitter. Okay, um, I'm just going to read something, an excerpt 
from a piece from David Haberman, if that's all right to read somebody else's. Um, it's called How I Learned to Like the Eagles Hotel, California. The nightclub was a one of a kind establishment where men and women performed the rituals of the mating dance. It was an old club by Thai standards. Sometimes I felt my friends were scared of finding themselves there. After all, they were on the cusp of becoming old themselves every night. The elderly fellows would line up and enter the cabaret and members of the fair sex would do the same. You could hear the music and the band calling to them like bees to honey. The ladies who came on to this disco weren't exactly uh, too elderly, more like over the hill women, mature freelancers, middle aged housekeepers, hotel clerks, etc. I uh, hope it's more rich for my boyfriend. But the mature fellows who frequented this club, an old English gentleman told me, I'm almost 72. My wife passed away a few years ago. If it was in, for this old Thai club, I would be in a nursing home in England. My kids, my relatives don't want me anymore. Who wants an old man? Who wants to be responsible? No one, mate, no one. It was typical of the men who went there, men from around the globe who either didn't have families or weren't wanted by them anymore, place for our kids. One night of many I had spent there, I sat down on the outside, performed, looking in, ordered a drink and watched the couples dancing away. The band played with us though, and I could feel the enthusiasm for life these people had, the passion they shared with each other. That night the men were alive, and for that one night they were young again. They were lucky. They had escaped the nursing homes, convalescent centers, the assisted living communities, their children who had you know use to them. And the woman smiling with happiness looked younger than the years, in the best clothes and makeup. Would this be the night they escaped poverty and scored the wealthy foreigner? Two more par uh, short paragraphs. The van was all dressed up in light blue outfits, and maybe the drinks weltering uh, pie nights had gotten to me. All of a sudden, the band was playing Hotel California, the song I couldn't stand. I could hear the lyrics. Welcome to the Hotel California. Such a lovely place, such a lovely face. We welcome you to the Hotel California. Any time of year, you can find it here. After that night, whenever I hear Hotel California playing somewhere, I simply remember those smiling couples dancing close, so close, floating in happiness as if they were in heavenly rapture. Thank you. Um, all right, next up we have uh, Michael Anton and Patty Carrigan. Do you want to go eat? Yes, I'm trying to skip nights. Michael still here? Or maybe he left. I don't see him. Um, all right, next up then we if he shows up, we'll go back to him. But Patty Carrigan, you're next. Thanks. Two pieces. I am from a place where out of borrow moths decorate their wings in ancestral rainbows. My fluorescence has power. Ashkenazi forewings and hindwings, stronger, more radical than your average monarch. Thank you. Last one. I put on my mother's shoes and walked on city streets, crossed af asphalt and cobblestone gutters, climbed various staircases to subways, schools, jobs, apartments, sometimes took elevators when available. I felt the leather tighten, heard souls sigh. Pain rose up vascular roadways, a headache signaled to action. A pass, a telepathic rerun. I already know how it would end. Emotions created her worlds and lines and no two fingerprints were alike. Unanswered questions stepped on anger and grief. Wondered why I still shrink in my own shoes. Thank you. Patty. All right, next up we have uh, the withdrawn. Deborah Clapp. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm so sorry. Okay, Deborah Clapp and then the withdrawn. I apologize. I apologize. Okay. Ahead, Hi, everybody. Two poems, spring 2021. <clears throat> 
if spring never came back after this past winter, that would be it. The last straw. Walking outside, feeling the breath I take in, the new spring air, I begin to feel lighter. Looking up at the trees, seeing the young green buds poking out of old winter bone branches, thousands of pink and white delicate petals, I feel my heart start to feel hopeful. Strolling up the sidewalk towards Third Avenue, feeling the warmth of sun on my face, I feel the grace of a smile coming under my mask. I feel grateful. I have errands to run. Only I just keep the smile, the gentle smile on my face by crossing the streets to whatever side the sun is on, letting myself just be with the sun, staying out, walking, feeling, being. Welcome back spring, we need you. The next one is called happy dating. I mean, happy dating. <laughs> he seemed nice, nice enough, on time, mask on, two vaccines confirmed. He bought the coffees at the Asterisk Place Starbucks. Then we crossed Lafayette and sat on a rock near the scaffolding in front of the Chase Bank. Then he showed me pictures of him with his grandson and son-in-law fishing when he had a house and a boat on Fire Island. Then he told me one of the reasons he said yes to meeting up with me is because I didn't mention I wanted a travel partner, that he'd traveled enough all over the world, in fact. Then he showed me a list of all the places around the world he'd traveled with his wife. Over 53 years of marriage, She'd only been gone for two years now. She died on the early side because of complications from 9-11. They lived in Tribeca. His daughter had set up this online dating thing to help him get out of the apartment. Wow, a whole life lived with the works, plus depression. I can't compete with all that. Then he asks me if I wanna go get something to eat. I say, no, but I'll walk with you along the Hudson River sometime. That was before he came, we came to the part when he said he's an atheist and a Republican. After that, I just laughed, wished him well. Then I went home. Thank you. Ebra. All right, next we have the withdrawn. Okay, this piece is called what it's, oh shit. What it's like feeling like a contaminant in someone's life you care about. You understand that you are far from toxic. But at the same time, feel like you are the very bug that will damage them. There's a reminder that someone else is better for them than you are. That they aren't worth being put in harm's way because of the war you fight no matter their willingness to fight with you and for you. And on days you feel weak because when they vow to not walk away, you remind yourself that they should. The voices say it'd be best to leave because your struggle wasn't ever supposed to be their struggle too. You don't ever leave though because every part of your being knows you don't want to. Every part of your being doesn't want you to. No matter how many times you become aware, it soon fades away again. You're reminded that the point of leaving is to rescue the other person from yourself. The heart chimes in time after time to say that it has won the game of tag and is tired. The mind lives for the back and forth action 
repeatedly poking at the heart when it's on the bench for a break. You begin to expect the other individual to leave, waiting for the day they decide, I can't take it anymore. And just like that, they are free. You are free to tell yourself, I saw this coming. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was great. Very nice. All right. Um, Lisa Walker is next. And then we have Barbara Rosenthal and Rick Christensen and Linda Swartz. And then Garrett um, Christopher. So uh, Lisa Walker, you're next. Unmute. Unmute, yep. I'm ready? Okay, okay. Um, this piece is called Four Violations. It's written in the language of the times, uh, which was 1986 when this book was published by Visual Studies Workshop Press, Sensation. The first time she was violated, little boys from the neighborhood lined the crack of her ass with twigs. Her mother cleaned her out, but didn't get angry. Not being punished made her very uneasy. The second time she was violated, her mother was at work and she could run home to an empty house from the man who locked her inside the front seat and lay on top of her and pretended to need her help fixing some hard to reach place under the dashboard, but really was rubbing himself against her. From underneath him, she saw retarded Joni ride by on training wheels and thought of Joni's peanut butter mouth and knew it wouldn't help to call for help. The third time, she was already 16 and doing a little too much flirting. She liked the balding young man who played tennis and they took a drive in the country. She liked it when he kissed her. She pretended she'd go further, but she never pretended she'd go all the way and refused. He put a rubber on, awkwardly. His car had itchy gray upholstery, and still she refused. Turn over, he said. She didn't understand. Let's have your ass, he said. She'd never heard of such a thing. He began to roll down the window and roll off the rubber. Oh, no, don't, she said. You can't get pregnant this way, little fool. They looked at each other and realized their bargain. The rubber stayed on as he entered her high, gasping pain. The fourth time was on a rainy night in Rome. The pensioniere collected both their passports and made Enrico take two rooms. She and Enrico were drunk and she was only glad to get laid, but Enrico began to get pushy. Enrico wanted everything too fast. Enrico tore her dress and tore her stockings. He pushed her down, he bruised her elbow. It was very damp and cold. Enrico bit at her. There was no pleasure, only clamminess. She pushed him away and he threw himself down on her and shoved himself in inside her, faster, 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 pulling on her shoulders for leverage, pulling on her hips. Have you had it yet, baby? Have you had it? She faked an orgasm, but stayed until morning. Thank you, Barbara. Okay, now we're gonna go to Lisa Walker. Hi there, you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. This is a song I wrote. It's called About You. I thought 
I saw you walking In a crowd the other day I thought I heard you calling Another picture of you You're everywhere in this whole town The memories I turn to Thank you. All right. All right. Next up, uh, we have Linda Schwartz. Linda, are you singing or are you doing a poem? Uh, poem. Okay. Go ahead then. All right. The first one is traditional. It's called Cherry Blossoms in Full Bloom, Flushing Meadows Park. Come, my children, gather round for peace and joy you have found. All cultures, all occasions, all manner of fun beneath my umbrellas, dappled shields from the sun. Sweethearts picnic, families play, graduates mark the special day. Cherry blossoms pinks, shedding tears of love, carpeting the shadows, life blows from above. And um, the second one is a duo rhyme that I wrote uh, for a recent homework assignment, 12 lines of eight syllables each, first two and the last two rhyme and the eight middle ones rhyme to each other. It's called pandemic dualities. There's many a duality it's clearly a reality. While man wears masks, birds freely sing, creatures relieved to roam as king. Essential clerks has a fine ring, increased minimum wage they sing. COVID's now substantiating, an old cause long percolating. The POTUS was ever lying, seen were pain and people dying. There is clearly a malady. We're crushing its reality. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. All right, next up we have um, Rick Christensen and then um, we will have Garrett Bimstifer. Um Rick, you're up next. Rick Christensen, everything, everyone. Good evening, uh, great stuff tonight. Thank you, everybody. Uh, this piece came out this week actually in the spring 2021 edition of uh, Muddy River Poetry Review. It is called George's Bloom. The bad stuff never stops happening, really. It fades for a while and then reemerges as prophecy. We learned that about memory. 
experience cuts deep lines into the self. Families are like storms. They can rumble and darken for a while, and then the rain starts. Sometimes there's lightning and you hope for shelter because it can steal your breath away and cause third degree burns. You may wish that it was all more like a game of checkers, a board you could pull out only when you wished, a set number of pieces, half one shade and half another, always assembled in the same configuration with unchanging rules and predict predictable outcomes. But instead you have to listen for the wind, sniff the air, watch the clouds. Sometimes you have to hurry home. We lost George a couple of years ago, but he is still somehow present. I do not hear his voice. It is hard to explain. I sense his intent. He urges me toward patience and acceptance as I prepare for each coming storm. I do not hear his voice, but I feel the words. I feel more than the words. I feel the meaning of those words and their importance. It is conveyed to me daily and most strongly when the wind has risen and I can smell how deep the rain is going to be. Patience and acceptance, almost like a yoga coach whispering behind your right ear, breathe. The experience is figurative, not literal, but it is him. Soon after George was gone away from us in all of the ways and manners in which most people mark departure, I was looking at a yard full of identical bushes. Each bush was covered by green tinged blossoms, but there was one blossom that bucked the trend, a flower going its own way. It was brilliantly white and seemed to surge forward away from all the rest. It was unexpectedly unique. I knew that it would fade and wilt and that over time, new storms would scatter its pet petals but I hope for it to reemerge as prophecy. And it has. Patience and acceptance. George's Bloom. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. All right. Um, next up, we will go to um, Garrett, and then we will go to um, Ron Combe, and uh, Austin Alexis, and Susan Wyman. So, Garrett, you're up next. Sounds good.
very much, Garrett. All right. Um, actually, I, I skipped off Austin Alexis. I said his name earlier. So Austin is next, and then we'll go to Ron Cohn. Go ahead, Austin. I apologize for that. I can't hear you, even though you're unmuted, Austin. It's you're unmuted over here, but I, the sound isn't coming through. Can anybody else hear him? No. All right. Um, you want us to come back to you? You want to play around and we'll go to Ron and we'll come back, Austin? Okay, so Ron will go next and Austin can play with his system over there. Go ahead, Ron. Okay. Uh, a couple days ago, Phil Jambri posted this beautiful photograph of East Side Bookstore. Um, I worked there five years um, back in the 70s called An Incident in Eastside Bookstore for Ann Waldman. I'm sitting behind the cash register in Eastside Bookstore on St. Mark's Place near 2nd Avenue looking at a postcard that's taped to the wall of Ann Waldman, topless. It's been there a long time, but I've never actually read the message she wrote on it. So I'm kind of distracted and I almost don't notice a guy duck into the office where the manager's bike is chained to a desk. I'm alone in the store, and I don't think Ann Waldman will be coming to my rescue. The guy comes out of the office wheeling the bicycle. He must have cut the lock somehow. Hey, I shouted him as he approaches the door. That doesn't belong to you. Put it back where you found it. He leans the bike against the bookshelf and slowly walks over to where I'm perched on my stool. Gripping the edge of the counter, I look down at him. He's short and stinks of alcohol. His eyes glazed over, but he lashes out lightning fast with a knife that sinks into the top of my right hand. The blade gets stuck in the cartilage and he can't pull it out. So he simply lets go and stands there motionless like a toy whose battery has died. There must be something seriously wrong with me because I suddenly find myself lecturing this neighborhood junkie. I could do anything I want to you, I tell him, picking up the club we have under the counter and waving it for emphasis. You're small and drunk and stupid. I could probably even kill you and get away with it, but that would be pointless. I yank the knife out of my hand and give it back to him. Just get the fuck out of here. He exits the store, slashing some flyers posted near the door as he does so, leaving me and Ann Waldman alone again. <laughs> Thank you. And thank you, Philip, for putting that photograph up. It was beautiful. It was beautiful. All right. Thanks for sharing that, Ron. Austin, do you think you have your computer working? Austin? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead, Austin. Great. One very recent poem, Niagara Falls. The churning water is calling beckoning with glints, chanting about me and to me, urging me to hurl myself with violence into its silver violence. Its voice transcends asking, its iridescent voice commands. And should I obey with a lunge over the guardrail what will I hear once I am dead, once I am no longer I? Will I become one who is one with nature? No longer an individual, I will be the waterfall itself, a game of liquid, both water and blood, both unseen saliva and pulverized flesh, riding a merry-go-round of gleaming velocity as in a manic ride at an amusement park, I will ride the life force of the booming downpour into athletic torrents, tumbling, somersaulting, playing a sport the surges will win at my expense. Days later, my severed foot found among rapids, my crushed skull located between glistening river rocks. Days later, the final score will be my body done with life's roaring roller coaster. 
but not prepared for the stark hush of the afterlife. Thank you. Thank you, Austin. Okay, coming up, we have um, David Elsassa, Susan Wyman, Alice Sanford, and Bernard Hicks. Uh, David Elsassa, you're next. Okay. Finding the plot. A sea of gravestones. I roam rolling cemetery hills. Wave after wave of human spark washed through this world with a slap on the butt, smiles, frowns, and a lifetime intermingling. I drift free, little boat bobbing about, a family search. But everywhere, only unfamiliar granite rises and sinks. Demarest, Johansson, Miller, Green, Levy. Couldn't you just whistle, Dad, that great ear piercer? Give me my bearings once more. So long ago now, I recall great barrenness, that first visit here. My few flowers on grandma's grave, few headstones only, lonely sentinels. More bushes than stones, big brown rabbit hightailing about, me gleeful, chasing, family hushing me. How different now, how full, how fraught these hills. Zolo, Frazier, Rubenstein, Gregory, Frola. What ground did each cover? What arc did each plot? Rising and falling. I trek on. It could still be a ways. One more, Lighthouse. Blazing, small but festooned, an all year Christmas tree on this first floor Riverside Drive window. Every night for years, approaching I'd wonder nightly, would it still be there and why all year Yuletide? Now it's finally vanished, this Upper West Side light show, gone today, extinguished with an aged solstice devotee or retired in victory, heralding what personal illumination? Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow, nights when I trek sleepy off the highway, three sheets to recollection, I'll conjure that bright spot and light a candle behind my eyes for the unblinking keeper of that light. Very nice. Thank you, David. Thank you. Uh, I don't think Susan Wyman is here. Um, so, um, Susan, right, you're not here. I don't. I think she left. Um, so, Alice Sanford would be next. Oh, Alice I'd like to thank you, Linda oh, and Madeline. It's been wonderful being with you through the pandemic. And thank you for being here, Alice. I met Alice in Lexington, Kentucky, at a writer's workshop with Dorian Locks. Right. It was wonderful. It was so great, yeah, when the world was normal back a long time ago. All right, go ahead, Alice. Don't okay. take her time away because we were talking. From Nashville, Tennessee, the wrong place. Here we are in writing class at Vine Street Christian Church when a dark hell's angel swaggers in and asks, is this essay? We say no, but as he leaves, we yell, do you mean writing? He rematerializes and says, no, essay, 12 steps. Now we don't know. Maybe this is some new technique he thinks we'll teach him. So we answer, the choir is in the other building as he and his black leather jacket leave again. Someone says, S-A, Smokers Anonymous and lights a cigarette. Someone else says, no, Sex Anonymous. I can imagine smokers wanting to be anonymous, but sex seems kind of tete a tete. And they say, no, giving it up like alcoholics. I can't imagine giving up scotch or sex, cigarettes or chocolate, especially not sex. But the woman who says it's sex claims some people do because their bestial urges interfere with their normal adult lives. 
and I know there ought to be a story in that. Only, if you were having sex all the time, I don't see why that would be a problem, except for missing out on chocolate and a couple of late night TV shows and maybe skipping work once in a while. Possibly you'd see a shoe or a certain movement of a hand and flowing creamy between your thighs, blood pumping faster in your chest, your eyes would brighten, the phone would ring. May I help you, you'd say, and really mean it. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. All right, next up we have Bernard Hicks, then Lindell Sandlin, Mindy Madrasovic, and uh, then Lionel Laverde and Alma Birch. So um, Bernard, you are up next. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Linda, for having me. And I don't know about y'all, but I will be waiting for Lisa's concert. Great job, great musical rendition of that song. The name of this poem is Lives of Contrasting Education. From Harlem to Howard, an education from both is empowered. From the numerous books with sheets to the streets teaching life lessons for keeps. Lessons given from teachers and moderators. Life being taught on milk crates in front of bodegas. Notes being taken on notepads and iPads. Scholars from the streets are those wearing toe tags. Studying till late at night leads to great test results. Same hours on the corner receive dirty looks and tight handcuffs. Three hours to go before the start of class. Three friends lost their lives to the streets way too fast. Wishful parents hoping to get grant money from Pell. Saddened parents setting up GoFundMe accounts for bail. Receiving either one is a big relief. Sending one kid back to college, the other kid back to the streets. Proudly strutting down hallways with hardwood floors. Mindlessly walking down tenement hallways with graffiti walls. Walking with books worth about 50 grand. Walking past closed libraries as if vacant land. Studying subjects that's going to put you in that nice high rise. Studying cars as they slowly drive by so you don't get caught up in the next drive by. Going on interviews to start your career. Going to the parole board hoping it's your year. Getting the phone call saying the job for you is here. Walking out the gates, breathing in freedom and shedding a tear. Graduation day and students count their blessings. Acquittal at trial and life has delivered another lesson. Switch your tassels and throw your caps in the air. Walk out the courtroom, return to the hood and hope somebody cares. Contrast and education. Thank you. Thank you, Bernard. All right, Mindy, let me know that she won't be reading. So next we have Lindell Sandlin. Letter from Camp Corona. <clears throat> Hello, Mara. Hello, Fada. Here I am at Camp Corona. We've been very isolated. We'll have fun when everyone's been vaccinated. Last March and April were very frightening. I would rather have been struck by lightning. All night and day we heard siren screams. Kept hoping we'd wake up from all these awful dreams. I don't really mean to scare ya, but we'd been better off having malaria. One side effect of having corona. Facebook said men never get another boner. Many governors came to hate the president who was once a New York City resident. Trump called them all a bunch of sissies until Cuomo fought him back just like Ulysses. The CDC told us keep six feet distance because the COVID bug had resistance. At first they said no masks, then changed their mind. It's been a very confusing time. Restaurants and businesses all had to shut down and noisy Times Square became a ghost town. Museums and theaters too all went dark. I kept sane by taking walks in Central Park. Each night my cooped up 
fellow New Yorkers, cheered all our medical and essential workers. Wearing a top hat, looking like a dork, I sing, sang to my neighbors through a bullhorn, New York, New York. This tiny virus exposed our broken systems, widened the divide between the us's and them's. While Wall Street markets rose and soared, disenfranchised, jobless, hungry people roared. When that cop knelt down on George Floyd's neck, it was the final straw that broke the camel's back. Some called it protest, some called it riot. Either way, black voices will no longer be kept quiet. Just when we thought things could get no worse, voting during COVID became a curse. Despite gerrymandering and poor losers lying, Americans elected a black woman with Joe Biden. It's been a year since Camp Corona started. Half a million Americans are dilly departed. Maybe this fall we can quit wearing a mask. To build back better is now everyone's task. Thank you. Thank you, Lindo. All right, next up we have Alma Birch, then we have Jimena Ramos Yango, and then James Bryant. And we're getting down to the wire here. So um, thanks for hanging in with all of us, everybody. And I think. Yeah, Lindo, I didn't know if I was going to be last. No, I think I skipped mine to Laverde also. I'll go to you next. Sorry, I'm sorry. All right, I, all right. Go ahead, Alma, and then we'll okay. get to you. Go ahead, sorry. Cool. I'm going to read two poems, they're pretty new. Uh, the first one is called Pizza Party. The pizza of today is not the slice of my youth. The triangle is small. The civilian is gone. What has happened to the slice of my youth? The sauce is runny. The cheese is all oil. The crust is like rubber. When I was a kid, forget about it. When I was a kid, forget about it. I guess there's nothing to remember. It was a different time. Shootings and drugs and death and AIDS and welfare and poverty and the laughter of a child. Hark back to another time. The train in the snow during a blizzard. The cold you dream of in August. The light strikes the pond. The pizza slice floats away. Oh, to be a pepperoni. This is where it got tricky. Stop and frisk, frisk and stop. Rock and pop, the clip, the lock, the violence in the park. Where did all this hatred start? All I can do is put it in the art. There were chalk marks on the ground and blood stains on the concrete. Little poor feet running the street. And this uh, second poem is called, What Dreams May Come. Dancing in erotic light, we just exactly, and that was hide everything and nothing to paints splatter, slide down mound, dinner is served, feed me a fish, ephemeral plastic bag float, clothesline shadow, light strikes one side, basketball hoop is down, there is new growth, Shadows cause rectangles, rectangles cause lines, lines cause cornice triangles to pop. The star of David appears, the seal of Solomon shines, sitting on a porch, drinking lemonade, ivy on the buildings, sheet music on the wall. Thank you so much. Thank you, Amma, for being here. It's great to see you again. All right, now Lionel, I very apologize. Excuse me, Lisa. Excuse me, Lisa. Robert Mueller, Robert you're on the Mueller. list. You're on the list. You're after James oh, Bryant. Oh, good, good. Okay. Yeah, we're coming down to the end. Thank um, you. Okay. All right, Lionel. I'm muted. Okay. Call you. Go ahead. Great. Uh, four ten eleven. These are the final moments of now. Ends of certain ages. Last remarks. The fading haze conceals new truth, which is eternal but unseen before. And here we reach these shores. 
In every moment tunes will play and death and life will dance their way besides the fulcrum pivot point of transformation with each other. For change will change itself and that which died before returns anew with traces of the past and now more, but that which dies for this itself will find its own renewal. How little we seem to know, yet we feel it, that more time-defying truth blooms yet again, and spring thanks winter for the path it took. All right, and this is a sonnet, love poem. What divine beauty dares to look at me, vouchsafing her two eyes to see my soul? Why, tis the fairest thief alive who stole my troubles and replaced with ecstasy. But what if beauty would not care to be in same such place with that obsessive whole and forced by well-worn scripts to play a role? Would this sane choice kill love so easily? No, it would not, for love that is sincere will wait and find its clarified resolve. Though reasons move to escalate the fear, inserting end to that which should evolve, instead a deeper sight to eyes appear, so beautiful to make the doubt dissolve. Thank you, everybody. My uh, September 11th poem is coming out this September. Thank you, everyone. Being here, okay. Um, Jimena Ramos, R Rango, we um, skip over you. Are you? Hi. Hi. Hi there. My name is Jimena. I'm 19 years old, and I'm Peruvian. And I'm going okay. to read um, a poem from my book. It's called Born Reader. My alternative lyric. It houses the song of sovereignty. Armor letters on a carousel. Letters waiting for you, reader of the month. Talking about you is discussing oil. Classic natural emporium. You lighten artificial dexterity. In my soul, babe rosebush. I place a blue cardboard bouquet, a pencil that I just made, a notebook written in Spanish, and a candle. I'm sure it was your smell. You lighten the scarlet. You transform the bittersweet into cream. You keep the mason alive, and I miss you such a long for dream. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here. All right, next up we have James Bryant. Uh, is he? James, are you reading today? No, I'm not. I'm just here to watch. Thank you. Oh, okay. All righty. Um, okay, then we have Robert Mueller. Um, Robert Mueller is next then. Hey, nice to be here. Um, Welcome. First poem is a poem that's like a um, ecosystem. No loss, no shore, but clutter. No loss, no shore, but clutter. The pick of the porcupine are used to dwelling, and the caiman loves tumblers of wetlands, of claimants to coral, a spy banks on snorkeling. Not every day, but every hour, the shellfish solemnly swing. In their dimming snarls, their stilling rocks, less tearful slicks. When the powerful bower hides, it starts to flower, then stints at a slim notice of airy parts, light like sheltered shower, like school under. Praise the Lord. Okay, the other poem is uh, the name of a flower, of a wildflower. Nodding ladies' tresses, nodding ladies' tresses. Inviting suitors from all sides and straight up about it, as if the wavy lower lip, as if the line of size on this twirling 
did not create a fright, and yet to wrap the day with night and with loose cover, luck is lived in and no lack of braiding curls in a swamp in thick pulse and playful of thin. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Robert. Okay. Um, this I think we got everybody. Is there anybody I didn't get to? Next, we have Philip Giambri, will be our last reader. But is it, did I skip anybody before that? Um, wave your hands in front of the screen or something if I, but I think I got everybody. But I want to thank everybody for being here. We're going to have Philip will be our last reader and um, look for Fahrenheit Open Mic to go live somewhere, hopefully in the outdoors in the summertime and move to a new home in September. So um, we, we hope to see you guys again and maybe we'll be back on Zoom. Nobody knows the future. But um, it was great to meet new friends on Zoom and um, I really appreciated that you shared your time with me and with everybody here. So uh, let's go to Philip and um, we'll have him close out our show. This is called Love Walks In, one short piece. Love walks in that night out of nowhere says, hey, I'm back. I ain't looking and I ain't ready, but here comes love swaggering in like some drunk ass sailor saying, take it or leave it, baby. I'm thinking now I might just be a game for this one. So in a booze-soaked bar night, I call love's bluff. And what looks at the time like a surefire train wreck turns out instead to be a five-year gold bar for two bodies tethered now by love, romance, and poetry. Two broken souls healed and blessed with redemption. Thank you. Right, that's our show. I think we have everybody, right? I didn't leave anybody out. I would hate to turn it off and leave anybody out, but um, all right, that's our show, guys. I'm gonna unmute everybody, and then we could all cheer and um. Yay! Thank you, Philip and Madeline. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, all, everybody. Thank you, everyone. I couldn't have done it without you guys. Great to hear everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to see you all. Good job, Madeline. How do you do it? You have to watch the seconds. Uh, yeah, uh, definitely it's work. Yes. But yeah. Out of out of Great love job. and joy. Good. Thank good. You, I'm glad. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Uh, help, help us Great find a place. Everybody. Help us Great find night. alternatives to be in. You know, mm -hmm. put your heads together, please. Yeah, if anybody and has an outdoor gonna... suggestion or an indoor suggestion, you know, yeah. black and white was our home, and they closed on Halloween. Um, oh. This reading Fahrenheit was there for 20 years before I took it over. I mean, I took it over just in 2018, I believe. And um, yeah, but that reading was going there forever and um, we'll miss that place. So yeah. we'll Lin Linda, how are you feeling? Any after effects from the COVID? I have a little, but I'm getting better. I'm going to my doctor next week. So I'm going to get checked, but I'm hanging in there. I'm fighting this thing with everything I got. So when people tell me, try this herbal remedy. I try anything just to knock it out, but I'm getting better. So I what are your linger <laughs> What are your lingering with like congestion? Tiredness? I have like congestion oh, in my nose. Oh. I can't get rid of it, you know. Okay, and then okay. the energy is kind of like I fight that every day. The Do you mean fatigue? Yeah. yeah. I, I wanted to thank. I wanted to thank our non-New York and New Jersey friends. It's just been that's been the mm -hmm. one good thing about COVID. Uh, certainly, there's a few <laughs> other things, but right, it, a lot of people together from far you. away. We'll yeah. miss very much. Yeah. And if you ever come to New yeah. York from out of town, you know, plan to come on the first Sunday of the month and you can come to Fahrenheit. Uh -huh. Very That's good. It. David Alsace, are you there? I'm here, Patrick. Good to, to see you. you. How are you? Yes. This was great, wasn't it? Absolutely. Okay. It's great seeing a lot of old faces and a lot of folks I've never seen some yeah. years so yeah. far away. And no. I think Mindy's yeah. been listening or watching or, yeah, or she didn't want to uh, read today. I, I thought she was going to read. She said that she was just listening. There she is. Yeah. All right. Good night, everybody. Good thank you. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good thank you. Night. Thank you. 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 Thank you.